Hello everyone, Blackfoot Ferret here, with a Five Nights at Freddy's theory that shakes up everything we know and explains two of the oldest mysteries in the game. We all know the purple guy is an evil child killer, but have you ever wondered how one guy, even a mutated ninja, could overpower five kids at once and have time to smash them one by one to steal animatronic frames before any escaped or even called for help? The answer is simple, he didn't. Not alone. There's a second villain hiding in Fazbear's Pizza. And believe it or not, the purple guy isn't the one you should be most afraid of. First, meet the color brothers, the purple guy and the pink guy. Okay, he's more of magenta, but pink is simpler and in theory videos, simple is good. Most people, even me, thought they were the same person, with the purple guy being the older version. But let's take a closer look. The purple guy is tall and thin, with a long neck and a hunched forward head. He has white eyes and sometimes wears a badge and carries a tool in his hands. The pink guy, our newest friend and oldest as well, is shorter, stockier, and slightly lighter in shape, with almost no visible neck. He stands straight with black eyes. It's not just the difference in shade, the physical differences are remarkable. If Wario and Waluigi had a third set of even eviler twin brothers, it would be these guys. Or maybe it's just them. The purple guy first appears in the game two minigames, sometimes ambushing 8-bit oh, Freddy as he explores, whoa, whoa. giving the message you can't when he catches you, in reference to saving the kids. The pink guy first appears outside Fredbear's family diner, jumping out of his purple mobile to kill a crying child, a child who became the marionette. In FNAF 3, the purple guy waits for each of the kid animatronics to follow Purple Freddy outside the secret room, then rushes them and stabs them in the back once they turn to leave when they find they can't enter the doorway. The pink guy shows up again in Foxy's minigame in game 2, watching with a smile as Foxy runs into a room full of dead kids. The purple guy piloted the yellow Spring Bonnie suit when he lured the original five children to the back room to their doom. Later, he was scared into wearing the SB suit again while it was wet, causing the spring locks to fail and impale him, turning him into the monster spring trap. The pink guy piloted the second special suit, the yellow GF suit, and was later stuffed into it, becoming someone we'll talk about later. First, how do we know for certain that there are two people? For this, we again turn to our beloved unreliable narrator, the phone guy, and the things we learned in Five Nights 3. We learned of the spring animatronics, an early series which could transform from animatronics to suits people could wear once a spring crank was applied, flattening the robotic parts to the inside of the suit, where they were then held in place by spring locks. Nifty, but dangerous, because if the spring locks ever failed, the robotic parts would impale the person wearing the suit, killing them or worse. We also learned of the secret room in each restaurant that was off camera and impossible for animatronics to enter, where high ranking employees could find safe haven in the event anything should go wrong. Digging deeper, we learn the phone guy cannot be the purple guy. He's the one that notices the spring bonnie suit has been moved and warns people to never use it again. Ultimately, he gives the order to have the secret rooms at most locations sealed permanently behind a false wall, locking the spring bonnie suit away forever, or at least until the events of Five Nights 3. Phone guy also mentions a new character for the first time. Priority and break bad bears pizza why the classic suits are being retired to an appropriate location while being looked at by our technicians. Technician singular, not plural. Fazbear Entertainment has one technician in the area, presumably to maintain the animatronics. Purple Guy must have been more than a security guard if he knows how to use the SB suit, and use a spring crank as a melee weapon to quickly suitify possessed animatronics, tearing them apart in the process. This is a person who's worked at the restaurant for some time, and is very likely the technician Phone Guy spoke of. So, Phone Guy isn't the Purple Guy. This means he's just an innocent, misunderstood bystander, right? No. Nothing could be further from the truth. We learned a lot about Phone Guy himself in Five Nights 3. With every game, Phone Guy's authority seems to grow. In Game 1, he was head of security, training new expendable night watchmen with recorded phone messages. In FNAF 2, he reveals a deep understanding of every animatronic model design, particularly their weaknesses, almost as if he designed them himself. And in Game 3, he's in charge of not just one restaurant, but a chain in the area, acting very much as if he were CEO of the company. Even ignoring the fact that working for Fazbear Entertainment beats Alaskan crab fishing for world's most most dangerous occupation, and that CEO Phone Guy must be on OSHA's terminate on site non compliance list. Phone Guy also knows things that no sane person would know, not without calling the police. Phone Guy knows exactly what it looks like when a person is crushed into an animatronic suit. The only parts of you that would likely see the light of day again would be your eyeballs and teeth when they pop out the front of the mask. <laughs> yeah, they don't tell you these things when you sign up. Phone Guy knows there's more to the animatronics moving at night than just unlocking servos, and deliberately lies to you about them seeing you as an endoskeleton without a suit, when we clearly see Bonnie backstage, ignoring a bare endoskeleton, giving the camera a meaningful look. And Phone Guy knows the fate of the five children, and never told the public or police about it, 
letting the hunt for the bodies continue without success. The player is able to figure out from the mysteriously appearing posters in the East Hall Corner and Game 1 that most of the children's bodies remained in the animatronics, but this mystery was never solved by the police of the Five Nights world. However, Phone Guy announces that After learning of an unfortunate incident at the sister location involving multiple and simultaneous spring lock failures, the company has deemed the suit temporarily unfit for employees. Multiple implies a number higher than two, more like five, and even dangerous as they are, if the springlock suits have been used successfully for months, having several fail all at once is a near statistical impossibility, unless someone made it happen. Phone Guy says that this location has two special spring suits, but there could easily be many other standard issue spring suits in use at other locations. The very fact that Phone Guy makes a tape to explain how to use spring suits proves that there is more than two, otherwise you could just treat the brave pilots in person, and Fazbear's has more than two characters. Spring Bonnie and Spring Freddy might simply make happy surprise appearances at each restaurant turn, introduce his rich yellow traveling uncles. The theory that children were crushed inside spring-cranked springlock suits also solves a main mystery of the game, namely how one crazed man in a bunny suit was able to overpower five kids all at once without any of them screaming for help. The basic idea of smashing a human skeleton into a steel animatronic framework itself seems impossible. It would require strength far beyond that of a normal human. You'd have to be either an insane robot or the Hulk to achieve such a feat, and it would pulverize the body long before the stuffing was finished. Unless, unless the animatronics were actually designed to impale humans. And as hair trigger dangerous as the spring suits are, it's hard not to imagine that the impaling risk isn't a bug, but a liberally designed feature. This, then, is the secret of how the purple guy killed the original five kids by himself. He offered to grant them a wish worthy of the worst of the Fae. How would you like to become your favorite characters, kids? Esteemed Uncle Spring Bonnie brought the five to the back room and opened the spring suits for them, letting them climb in and get comfortable. Then, before any of the kids realized what was happening, he spring cranked them all, releasing the animatronic parts. The kids never even had time to scream. In hindsight, it should have been obvious that we needed an additional character to complete the five kids' crime scene, since the killer couldn't both wear the yellow Spring Freddy suit and Suffolk Kid inside as well. Spring Bonnie was always there, as early as the picture along Game 1's West Hallway and inside the office itself. We just learned about him after the fact. And this was part of the message of the paper plate dolls, more evidence that Spring Bonnie Springtrap existed. Let's look at the dolls. The first time I saw a sequence of both Chicas taking interest in the first doll in Game 2, I thought Chica herself had made it, and was bringing it to your office as either a gift a warning, or a message, as if to say, I am human! Clearly, if the second two dolls were Bonnie and Freddy, the first one had to be Chica, right? But then, I noticed the buttons. The paper dolls have buttons, as many of the Game 2 animatronics have buttons. However, most have two, and there's only one that has three, the marionette who, now that we look closer, looks a lot like the first doll in other ways as well. The second doll looks very funny, with its crooked ears and tear stains down its cheeks, but the most striking thing is, that only has one button. Bonnie has two buttons. Who only has one button? Spring Trap. Again, with a second look, the likeness is very good. This leaves only the third doll, which is clearly a version of Freddy, but something is wrong. Zooming in reveals yellow eyes, but most versions of Freddy have blue eyes. That must mean the third doll is someone we'll talk about later. We were discussing Phone Guy, the worst boss in the universe. A boss so bad, he's criminal. Oh, and he likes Foxy. He loves watching Foxy. Did uh, Foxy ever appear in the hallway? He was always my favorite. He loves watching Foxy even when there are other things that might be worthy of attention, like the five dead kids in the next room. Unless, of course, he already knew about the kids, and in which case Foxy is much more interesting, especially when you think about what the guy in the Foxy spring suit is going to do next, and what he's going to tell the police when they come looking for him, and not the pink guy who watched him enter. Now it's time to use some imagination. What possible good could come from killing a child outside of a restaurant? To most people, the crime seems senseless, but they're not thinking strategically or psychopathically. You see, if you wanted to open your own restaurant and wanted to use someone else's popular character to do it, you could pay them a lot of money, or you could see that something bad happened that put their restaurant out of business. What good is a kid's place that isn't safe for kids? Fredbear's family diner would go bankrupt, and they'd sell the rights to Freddy and the amazing animatronic technology that animated him to anyone still willing to buy for peanuts. You'd show up, Offer them a small but given the situation more than reasonable offer, and go build your own restaurant and animatronics from a fraction of the cost, without having to worry about any competition. Children everywhere would cheer the return of their favorite characters, and parents everywhere would be impressed by the new security measures. You'd be considered a hero, CEO paint guy old chum, and you'd make the new restaurant bigger than the last place, and better in every way. Instead of one animatronic, you'd have several. Instead of one location, you'd have many, so many that you'd only be able to manage them all with messages over the phone 
and you and your right hand man slash brother slash minion would have special suits of your own. You'd prance about like the heroes you were, in suits of gold, and the children would cheer you wherever you appeared. And what wouldn't matter if it's all a lie, that your whole empire was based on the blood of a murdered child? Surely, all this good outweighs the cost of a single human life, especially when it serves your own needs so very well. What could possibly go wrong? The final thing we know about Phone Guy, who is none other than the pink guy himself, is that he knows the purple guy, and has for years. When faced with the knowledge that someone well acquainted with piloting the spring bonnie suit had killed five kids, Phone Guy could have gone to the police. Instead, he initiated a cover-up and made sure to seal incriminating evidence away in the secret room. If the purple guy talked to the police, it would mean doom for Phone Guy as well. So he either got Purple Guy out of prison, framed another employee for Purple Guy's deeds, the guy in the foxy suit comes to mind, or obstructed the investigation enough so that the bodies weren't found and the purple guy I got a very short sentence. Why would Phone Guy hire the purple guy in the first place? You might as well ask why he designed suits for the purpose of impaling humans. Again, it's time to use some imagination. Every mad scientist needs a minion, a partner in crime, someone skillful enough to be useful, weak enough to be controlled, and discreet enough to do the boring and dirty things that need to be done so you can continue your all important work without interruption. Especially if you can't stay on the side of blood. Remember how Pink Guy was going to make the restaurant better? The only things better than robots who do well at pretending to be alive are robots who actually are alive. It's long been the dream of science fiction to find a way to transfer the consciousness of a human into a stronger, smarter, longer-lasting robot body. And you can't make such an important omelet without breaking a few eggs along the way. Models needed to be tested, perfected, inspected, and rejected before taking the plunge and undergoing such a process yourself. The funds generated by the Fazbear restaurants helped Phone Guy get the best laboratory gear money could buy but he needed test subjects as well, which one he could not buy. So he turned the restaurant about a bear into a honeypot and had the subjects come to him. If some kids or security guards disappeared along the way, these things happen sometimes. Even Disneyland has had fatalities. The restaurant could withstand the occasional incident now and then. We see some of CEO Phone Guy's mad reasoning in the ghost posters and newspaper clippings. His vow that these robots will live on in the hearts of children sounds like a Walt Disney Vision statement until you apply the mad scientist logic filter and realize Phone Guy is making robots powered by literal human in children's hearts. The mad scientist mindset is also revealed in the complete passage quoted in the garbled night via phone call, an excerpt from The Autobiography of a Yogi. Sir, it is lamentable that mass agricultural development is not speeded by the fuller use of your marvelous mechanisms. Would it not be easily possible to employ some of them in quick laboratory experiments to indicate the influence of various types of fertilizer on plant growth? You are right. Countless uses of Bose instruments will be made by future generations. The scientist seldom knows contemporaneous reward. It is enough to possess the joy of creative service. Paraphrased, your machines are not used or appreciated by the public now, but they will be in the future. If you allow it, my experiments will prove their usefulness. I don't care about rewards. Doing science itself is enough. This could be a letter from Phone Guy to the original owner of Fredbear's Family Diner, the builder of the first animatronic, an innocent machine made to entertain children. Phone Guy is convincing him to sell over the rights, but has a very different vision of what the animatronics might become. This explains why Phone Guy left four kids in suits and let them rot there for years and years, and why in spite of having every reason to either burn the possessed animatronics and hide the evidence, or stay away from the robots to keep out of range of their vengeance, Phone Guy stayed in the restaurant himself each night, at a large risk to his own person. He needed to study the kids to see how well each model was working, performing experiments, making adjustments when necessary, attempting to control them with only limited success. Naturally, this work was very messy, so he had his faithful slash coerced minion by his side for that. The next few jumps are tricky, and the only way to advance is by asking another question. We know Phone Guy gave the order for the secret rooms to be sealed, but he apparently died, overwhelmed and stuffed into a Freddy suit by the kids, in the fourth night phone call of Game 1. But in Game 3, we see the demise of all the Game 1 animatronics when Purple Guy comes back, braving incredible danger to hunt down four killer robots in a restaurant that's been abandoned for years, all to re-kill the same kids he already killed years earlier. We know Springtrap was in the secret room when Dude Guy uncovered it, so he must have been inside when the ceiling happened. Happened, which means the ceiling must have happened after the minigames of Game 3, which happened after Phone Guy died. How could Phone Guy order the ceiling after his death? If he had the foresight to predict his own death, wouldn't he have the foresight to avoid it? To get to the answer, we need to first play a little game. I'm going to ask you a question, and we're going to see how well you know your Five Nights lore, and how well you've been paying attention. The question is, can you name an animatronic that physically survived until the time of Five Nights 3 besides Springtrap? 
A lot of you will probably say the marionette, and as much as I'd like it to be the case, it isn't so. Many have pointed out the marionette's mask seems to disappear whenever Springtrap gets too close on camera 8. However, look closely. The reason the mask is dark is that Springtrap is blocking the light, but you can still see the shadow of the mask's chin in spite of it. The mask hasn't moved, it's just very hard to see. And while the marionette's image looks lifelike right down to the reflection, it still has the burned phantom look in your office. The clincher, though, is that the marionette's paper play doll lays defeated in the office box along with the trash toy animatronic head. The marionette is dead. The next popular answer would be Mangle, since she is never expressly named as one of the phantom animatronics at the end of the game. But if you enhance her image in camera 4, she is burnt, just like the others, and the top part of her head is in the box as well. Mangle is dead. Nobody seems to know where Bonnie's ghost went, although from the minigames it's pretty clear he got ripped apart as well, and many of the toy animatronic ghosts aren't accounted for either. Anything's possible, but the answer I'm looking for is someone we're sure is alive, someone we never saw die. Perhaps I should rephrase the question. In Five Nights 3, who is still standing? We know that Springtrap is alive, not just because his menacing presence is everywhere, but because of this. Springtrap's paper doll is still standing, which means Spring Bonnie is still alive. And so is Spring Freddy. A much darker, yellower version of the third doll lurks in the game files of Five Nights 3, and while I haven't found a screenshot of it appearing in-game, it was clearly meant to be found. Two standing paper plates two yellow paper plates, and two yellow characters on stage in the secret minigames at what must be the first Fazbear Entertainment restaurant. If the first paper plate is the marionette, and the second paper plate heralds the arrival of Spring Bonnie slash Springtrap, that stands to reason that the third paper sculpture tells of the continued existence of Spring Freddy, even if he's outside the attraction. Spring Freddy, a second adult human crushed inside a Springlock suit. What would he look like? Probably similar to Springtrap in many ways. One, run down. Two, organics and robotics meshed together. Three, probably very angry. Four, once realistic for a kid's restaurant, which is why our new friend Nightmare Freddy, with his sprouting demonic heads, is out of the running. Beyond this, we can come up with a million theories about how Spring Freddy might look, but in the end, such theorizing is useless. Because we already have a picture. <laughs> And, as you can tell from the sharp bloody fangs and longer butter snout, this isn't Springtrap. This is a composite image, derived from the famous I Am Still Here teaser image for Five Nights 3. I am still here? What a strange thing to say. We've never met Spring Freddy until now, so how could we A. Know he was here before, and B. Think he had left? Unless, we have met this creature before, and had a very good reason to believe he was gone. Which means the phone guy must be the one, the only... Power thirst! Uncomfortably energetic! 400 babies! The energy drink that will make you... Uh, sword. Uh, what are you waiting for? Uh, Air blasters! Well, I've been pretty mysterious so far, haven't I? I've avoided saying the name of one famous character over and over again, despite so many chances to deliver the bombshell revelation. So why don't I just come out and say it? Why don't I stand on the mountaintop and know the world blow that phone guy as Golden Freddy? Because it's wrong. The phone guy is the pink guy, the designer of the restaurants, CEO of Fazbear Entertainment, the designer of the animatronic spring suits, and pilot designer and co-builder of the special GF suit with the help of the purple guy the technician. And he was permanently stuffed into the GF suit and spring cranked before his research was complete by the kids during Game 1, Night 4 phone call. But phone guy is not Golden Freddy. It's time to tell the story of our third color theme character, an old friend, which, despite his repeated attempts to kill us along with the other animatronics, is far more likable than the Color Brothers. Child number five, Golden Freddy, the hero of Five Nights 3. We've all seen the last fifth cutscene of Game 3, where he plays the ghost of a crying child without a suit, finally enter the secret room, and scare the purple guy into using the Spring Bonnie suit in spite of being wet, causing the springs to give up, and purple guy being crushed and transformed into spring trap. What we haven't seen is the beginning of this story, and just what a poetic reversal the confrontation is. We established earlier that the purple guy, likely under orders from the pink guy, donned the SP suit and tempted the five kids to climb into the other spring suits, and raced about with rabbit speed to spring crank the children, impaling them within the animatronics. The pink guy forgot to mention one important detail, though. Exactly which suits the purple guy should use for the deed. So after Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Foxy were loaded, purple guy got a dark idea. Whether it was inspired by a sense of impish rebellion against the pink guy, 
or the irresistible prospect causing more anguish to an even larger number of people. Purple Guy made a choice Heath Ledger's Joker would approve of. He put the fifth child into the boss's own golden GF suit. We know this for a fact because of the Happiest Day Final Secret minigame, where the marionette delivers the last cake to the fifth child as the first four look on, and child number five dons a lighter color Freddy mask that mirrors child number one's. Child number five is indeed Golden Freddy, and was stuffed into that suit. However, once Phone Guy discovered what had happened, he was furious. Phone Guy was content to let the first four children rot away in their respective suits, but finding the very symbol of his own authority, his personal spiffed up, tricked out, deluxe golden GF suit, hopelessly defiled by a child's blood and guts? It was too much! He had child number five's body removed and disposed of, and did what he could to repair his beloved suit. What became of child number five's body we may never know, but we do know that his spirit refused to leave the restaurant. This is a special thing about Golden Freddy. While the others became possessed suits of furry power armor a la Full Metal Alchemist, Golden Freddy is no suit of his own, and has always been a ghost from the beginning. This is why in the Give Life minigame, Golden Freddy has no body to receive a gift, appearing as a dead child for one frame before jump scaring the player. And this is why you see the light shining from inside Golden Freddy's spectral head in the bad ending of Five Nights 3, and why the head is completely missing in the good end once the spirits have departed along with the lights. There never was a physical head there. Speaking of ghosts, those with a good eye will have already noticed that Phantom Freddy in Game 3 is none other than Golden Freddy himself. Real Freddy might be in charge, but Golden Freddy is the expert at being a ghost, so he takes the lead this game, with Child Number 1 filling the rare spooky office cameo role instead. They all work together to scare the pants off the utter morons who broke open the secret room and unleashed Springtrap upon unsuspecting world again, thinking it would sell lots of carnival tickets. Remember the stupid guy who read the Necronomicon and summoned Cthulhu and was then eaten by same? You're basically that guy in the third game. It's no wonder the kids don't like you. Speaking of the kids, have you noticed how their ghosts still retain the shape and properties of the suits they were stuffed into, in spite of no longer having a physical presence? Keep this in mind, it becomes important later. Going back to Golden Freddy, it might be possible for him to possess the GF suit when it isn't being piloted by a human. But, as we can clearly see in Five Nights 2, someone is piloting the GF suit. This, in every external physical detail, looks to be the very same suit, in the very same pose as Golden Freddy when child number five fades into your office. But this isn't him. Meet color character number four, Purple Freddy. The physical GF suit being piloted by a human. He isn't actually purple, just appears that way through the true seeing power of simple 8-bit vision and image enhancement, showing us that this isn't Golden Freddy. This is Spring Freddy, although it's an early version. In Game 2, the suit has yet to be renovated, spring cranked with phone guy inside, and given time to ferment into the future organic mechanical horror we see in Springtrap. But Purple Freddy is destined to become a foe far more terrifying than the Bunny Man. Notice how the eyes light up so brightly? We see the same thing from the spring bonnie suit when Purple Guy enters it. That definitely means there's a human inside. The 8-bit Golden Freddy sprites from the second game show this property as well. You can think of Purple Freddy as Golden Freddy's opposite. The color is purple and yellow, aka gold, as Golden Freddy was originally called Yellow Bear in Game 1, are opposites on the color wheel, which is why Purple Freddy is purple. He's the inverse of Golden Freddy. Evil instead of good. Physical instead of ghostly. A guilty adult instead of an innocent child. Purple instead of gold. And Purple Freddy is the key to the huge elephant in the room question in game three that set everything in motion. Why did the purple guy come back? If our purple pal was trying to be cruel cruel, the most sadistic thing he could have done was nothing. Just leave the rusting robots in their leaking restaurant till time and the elements blissfully obliterated them at last. Extend their suffering for decades at no personal risk whatsoever. Not that I'd accuse a child killer of advanced reasoning skills, but while an adult overpowering five ten-year-olds is sadistic and messed up, outfitting those same five kids with towering suits of furry power armor, and then dueling all four of their remaining suits to the death one after another while armed with nothing but his wits and a hit them first or die horror spring crank tool is just plain stupid. Even deranged psychos understand that self-preservation is a positive thing that should be a very high priority. So what in the devil's doom domain could inspire the purple guy to challenge four killer robots with every reason to hate him to play Mortal Kombat against him and his trusty stick? There's only one explanation, that the person who ordered him to go back into the restaurant scared him even more than the kids did. Uh, and look who else we oh find hi. lurking about Hello. the restaurant. Purple, Purple Freddy. Freddy. Spring Freddy. Springtrap's cursed fraternal twin. The GF suit permanently stuffed with a large helping of Phone Guy. Since we don't know Spring Freddy's cool supervillain name yet, I'm going to simplify things and call this creature Phone Freddy. It's lame, but it's simple, and in theory videos, simple is good. 
It's very unlikely that Purple Guy could defeat Phone Freddy the same way he did the kids. Phone Guy designed the suits, and with a bit of grim self-operation, he could make himself spring crank proof. The GF suit is also advanced, and acts like real power armor under its cute funtime exterior. And Phone Guy is one of the craftiest people who used to be alive. No innocent white-eyed kid trying to relearn how to walk. Phone Freddy has also either retained or regained the use of Phone Guy's voice, since we know he gave the order to seal the secret rooms after his stuffing. So Phone Freddy can still pretend to be Phone Guy, as if nothing whatsoever were horrible horribly wrong. Chances are Phone Guy even wore the GF suit around the office, so people are used to seeing it and know it's him. And most office folks are wise enough not to annoy an eccentric boss with probing questions, especially when he can literally rip off your head when he gets mad. There's no law in the US to keep a deranged undead robotic Ursine Terminator from being the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, so Phone Freddy might have kept things going for quite a while before people began to really notice the changes. And he could simply run things as a voice over the phone for much longer. Phone Freddy would have his choice of intimidation when it came to handling the troublesome Purple Guy. He could threaten to release all the extensive videos of him killing children, or he could lazily bite off Purple Guy's head. He felt generous enough to give the troublesome technician his personal choice of doom for not following orders. Phone Freddy also has an excellent reason to return to the restaurant. Revenge! Like any Scooby-Doo villain who knows just how humiliating it is to have your ingenious plans foiled by a group of five weirdly dressed kids in a hipster van, Phone Guy has been downgraded from being Dr. Frankenstein to instead being the monster named after him, famous for cavorting with Tonto and Tarzan when he isn't playing Patriarch to the monsters. Just the thing to bruise a psychopath's infinite ego. And this revenge isn't limited only to the five kids in question. If anything should happen to the purple guy himself along the way, bonus! Fun Freddy is now permanently stuck in a suit that smells like failure and dead kid. The purple guy being responsible for at least one of those things. Ever tried to put on an old fursuit head that someone else has sweated and farted in for over a decade? Gross! Blech. Also, having Spring Bonnie and his pilot sealed away from the world for a few decades removes the chance of Purple Guy blackmailing Phone Freddy back, or leaking the news that he's really a monster to a press very willing to believe and report such things. Revenge on the kids, revenge on the Purple Guy. Five Nights 3 was a win for Phone Freddy. There's also no sign of the GF suit when Child Number 5 enters the secret room, although we've seen it enter the room repeatedly, evidence that someone else walked away with it or in it. Purple Guy has been cowering in the secret room, waiting for Phone Freddy to learn an animatronic, then diving out to stab them in the back before treating back to safety, leaving the suit pieces behind. If salvage was the goal, the Color Brothers would have gathered up the robotic pieces. Instead, they left them strewn about the room like garbage. Revenge had to be the motive. Child number 5 appears to us as a little crying ghost because he has no suit of his own, and 8-bit vision shows the truth of things. The purple guy, though, child number 5 looks like this. <laughs> Which is why Purple Guy is freaking out big time. Which goes back to Child Number 5 and Purple Guy, and the issue where each of the Phantoms still resemble the suit they were stuffed into. The Purple Guy thought he was safe in the secret room. After all, no animatronics can enter it. At least that's what the phone guy said, but think back, and you'll notice you've already seen an animatronic near the secret room over and over. Phone Freddy can enter it. After all, Phone Guy designed the restaurants with secret rooms so they might seem his personal bacon if anything went wrong. Sure, he told you no animatronics can enter, but Spring Bonnie can go back there. And did you really think he would put such a restriction in his own suit? One of the advanced features of the GF suit is they can enter the secret rooms. This is why you see four ghosts hanging out at the entrance of the secret room during the final confrontation with the purple guy. They don't enter the secret room because they can't enter the secret room. Each ghost has the former restrictions of the animatronics they were stuffed into. Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, and Fox he cannot enter the secret room, but Golden Freddy can. And so it was that when Purple Guy made his sick joke and stuffed Child Number 5 into the boss's GF suit, he unwittingly created a being with the power to destroy him. When Child Number 5 barged into the secret room, Purple Guy knew he was toast. After several moments of panicking and dancing away from the glowing bear specter chasing him, knowing the other four would tear him apart if he tried the door, Purple Guy made a last desperate gambit, turning once again to the spring bonnie suit, seeming to think he would protect him. But the roof was leaking and the springs were wet, and the rest is history. So why is the Color Brothers theory so important? Besides clarifying all the events we've gone over so far, it's the key to unlocking another great mystery of the series. First though, I have another question for you. If we know that this is child number 5, and this is child number 5, and this is Phone Freddy, and this is Phone Freddy, who is this? <laughs> This one is really hard. Let's review everything we know about the very first Golden Freddy. His appearances are random in the first game, but always begin with the West Hall corner picture changing to his jump scare image, accompanied by the sound of a spectral child giggling. The next time you close the camera screen, Golden Freddy is in the room. You can banish him by putting up the camera again, but if you stare at him for five seconds, you get his jump scare. The unique sound of a roaring adult. 
and then the screen goes black. No image of you stuffed into a Freddy suit. No way to return to the title screen. The game is over for good. It's long been argued that Golden Freddy must be a ghost or a hallucination because his image doesn't appear on any of the background cameras in the office. However, these cameras are finicky at best. Usually the cameras are completely black and show nothing as the game advances. We can't see what they show during Bonnie and Chica's jump scares because they completely block line of sight. The cameras only truly activate when Foxy steps through the door, as if there's some sort of motion trigger in the doorway. For an instant, you can also see Freddy in the cameras just when his jump scare begins, although whether this is the camera image or the mere reflection of him in the glass, it's hard to tell. If Golden Freddy got into the office through a Ford Hatcher vent, he might have avoided activating the motion sensors. If he entered quickly and silently while the doors were up, the cameras might have deactivated before you took a look. He blocks the left monitors, and the right ones are too far away to show a reflection, and we would have to triangulate all the vision fields in the right side camera system to make sure that they cover the exact spot in the office where Golden Freddy appears, which is hard because the images don't seem entirely consistent. To make the case that the original GF is child number 5, we can say the giggling sound that plays during the picture is his, and and the adult screaming sound at the end is Mike Schmidt losing his crap. Child number 5 is a ghost, so this is entirely consistent with the ghost invisible on the cameras theory. However, we can also make the case that GF is a freshly stuffed phone Freddy, still reeling delirious and furious after the trauma, willing to lash out at anyone or anything. Too nearly minted a monster to have yet developed the horrid mechanical organic mashup we see in Springtrap. The pink guy has black eyes, which could be why the original GF has tiny pinpricks and gaping empty eye holes. Literally speaking, there's a human body inside that suit, but metaphorically speaking, the suit is empty, filled by a killer devoid of the living soul which animates most of us. Phone Guy designed the restaurants and would know any hidden means of getting about, so it's not inconceivable he knows a way into your office other than the doors, and moving quickly and silently might be advanced powers of the GF suit. And viewing the event from the perspective that Phone Freddy is our visitor, the giggling noise of the portrait could be the kids laughing at Phone Freddy after they stuffed him, or being their victory in, and the unique adult roar you hear during the jump scare is Phone Freddy himself, howling out anger as he tears the player limb from limb. This would also explain the blackness at the end. Mike Schmidt has not been stuffed into a Freddy suit to return as a robotic zombie. Mike Schmidt is actually and truly dead, game permanently over. Now we have an impasse. There are compelling arguments for the original GF to be either child number 5 or phone Freddy. Is there any way to break this tie? There is. However, to find it, we have to ask one final question. One of the most famous questions ever asked about the game. Who is Mike Schmidt? Going meta for a moment, we know Scott Cawthon has admitted in a message that he's had two beta testers helping him from the beginning, and that I'm sure you could guess who they are. These must be the real world Mike Schmidt and Jeremy Fitzgerald. True heroes indeed for playing these games over and over and over. Scott would make sure to give each of his friends an important character in the game, with the player getting to be the protagonist, and Scott himself playing the principal villain as the phone guy. If you've seen my first episode of The Final Theory, you know what I think happened to Jeremy Fitzgerald, who he ends up becoming, and what he then did to ruin phone guy's plans of culinary combat. Conquest. He's a hero whose story remains to be told, who endured great personal sacrifice and may never be recognized by the world. We don't see the name of the player in Game 3 because he isn't important, one of two schmucks who were tricked into releasing Springtrap, who's more or less the star of Game 3 himself. Mike got to star in Game 1, Jeremy started in Game 2, so Mike got to go again in Game 3, and Jeremy is bound to show up again in Game 4. Fritz Smith, the temp of Night 7 of Game 2, is only a minor character who gets fired the very same night. Fritz is a common German first name, while Smith is a common English last name, so the game itself sounds made up. The only really important role Fritz has is to show you that on Night 7, Jeremy is gone, which leaves the security guard of Game 1, the ignomatic Mike Schmidt. And while I criticized him in comments in the first Game 3 episode for his conclusion about Game 1, I must now apologize to Matt Pat, because in the first episode, he got it right on the first shot. I've always wanted to say that Mike Schmidt was the purple guy, but going by the single villain theory, it seemed impossible. There were too many contradictions. Clearly the phone guy was a bad guy as well, so didn't phone guy have to be the purple guy? But if phone guy is the purple guy, why on heck is he recording messages to himself? Is this some weird version of the movie Memento? And then, we learn on night 4 that phone guy, the purple guy, is dead, so Mike Schmidt can't possibly be him. What the heck? Then who is he? We get a clue with how the animatronics treat each security guard differently. In Game 2, the animatronics are indeed trying to kill Jeremy Fitzgerald, but not because of hatred. They want to stuff him into a Freddy suit because they like him and want him to join them in their fight against the Color Brothers. So while they're trying to get him, they also treat Jeremy with a strange level of respect and seem genuinely glad to see him. Jeremy is afraid, but afraid for his life, not his very soul. And seeing the animatronics doesn't give him a mind-rending psychotic episode. But Mike? 
The animatronics hate Mike. The animatronics hate, hate, hate Mike Schmidt. And now, with the Color Brothers theory, we know something we didn't know before. Phone Guy isn't the purple guy, he's the pink guy, CEO of the company and the purple guy's boss, which leaves an important vacancy in the cast list. So now I can finally say, without any dithering or uncertainty, that Mike Schmidt is the purple guy, the pilot of Spring Bonnie and the future Spring Trap. Which is why Mike never quits his job, never leaves. He's just following orders. He knows what his boss will do to him if he fails him again. And while all four of the animatronics scare Mike Schmidt, there's someone else in the restaurant, a presence that scares him more than the other four combined, the phantom that keeps changing the pictures on the walls, taunting him with evidence of his deeds, a force that can write text on walls even behind a delicate spider web, a creature who seems to be everywhere and nowhere, the rebel who doesn't follow the rules, the cruel joke which is now on him, the monster he created himself and the one he knows in his bones is going to get him in the end. Child number five, Golden Freddy. It's him. Five Nights 4 is coming out on Halloween. Is this really going to be the final chapter? No, not by a long shot. First, the Nightmare animatronics are so incredibly over the top that there's no way anyone could have intended to place them in a restaurant for children. They are quite literally the worst thing anyone could imagine. Creatures that could only exist in nightmares. Then, there's the reverberating 8s and 7s all over the original page code and inside Foxy's eyes, referencing back to the bite of 87. And each Nightmare animatronic seems to be taunting you and ask, was it me? Which likely places Game 4 somewhere between Game 2 and 1 on the timeline, between 1987 and 1993. And maybe from the perspective of the victim of the Bite of 87 himself. The phrase of the final chapter was famously used by the fourth Friday the 13th movie, and Jason X, six movies later, is the one where the world's most brutal hockey enthusiast went into space. Nightmare Freddy's knife fingers are an easy reference to Freddy's namesake Freddy Krueger from the Nightmare on Elm Street movies, a child killer turned demonic spirit who kills people in their dreams after turning them into nightmares. And his sprouting demonic heads are a clear shot to Dream Warriors, the third movie in the series, and arguably the best movie in the franchise. Yeah, that's pretty horrifying stuff. Oh, and the release date of Dream Warriors? February 27th, 1987. So Game 4 will likely reveal more about the Bite of 87 as her victim fades in and out of consciousness, desperately trying to stay awake and not slip too long into the realm of nightmares, where literally anything could happen. But there are many more chapters of the story waiting to be written. We haven't met the genius behind the first animatronic and seen the fall of Fredbear's family diner. We haven't seen the very first Fazbear restaurant and the rise of the Color Brothers. And we know next to nothing about the mysterious Shadow Bonnie. What hand has he had in this mayhem? I'm still not entirely certain of what all happened the day of the second five children and became the toy animatronics were killed. If each toy animatronic is the counterpart to one of the originals, then Balloon Boy is the counterpart to Golden Freddy. What part does he play in this story? We've been told that Game 3 occurs 30 years after the last Fazbear restaurant closed its doors, but we've never been told what year it is in Game 3. Dude Guy in the newspaper repeatedly called the restaurant ancient and its technology prehistoric. 30 years is a long time, but not so long as to earn such powerful words. Maybe Game 3 isn't in 2023. Maybe it's in 2123. If the Bite of 87 put Fazbear Entertainment out of business for six years before it returned once again as a children's restaurant, then what level of blazing daylight massacre could force the chain to close for 30 years and abandon the idea of ever being a kid's restaurant again? We may have skipped over one or several restaurants between 1993 and whenever Game 3 occurs. And then we have the excellent hook Game 3 left us on a sequel for future games as well. We found some, some great new relics over the weekend and we're out tracking down a new lead right now. Trying to track down a good lead right now. Uh, some guy who helped design one of the buildings says it was like an extra room that got boarded up or uh, something like that. So we're gonna take a peek and see what we can find. Okay, keep an eye on things and we'll try to have something new for you tomorrow night. Someone from outside the restaurant, who never identified himself the Dude Guy and claimed to be the designer of one of the buildings, gave Dude Guy a tip about where to find the secret room in this particular building, a tip most likely delivered by phone call, a call that resulted in releasing Mike Schmidt upon the world again. 
Love them or hate them, masters need minions. Perhaps without Mike at his side, Phone Freddy was unable to keep the company and himself together, especially once the senior management began to flee from his deteriorating robotic corpse. And after decades of trying failed schemes by himself, unable to fit in with the rest of humanity, unable to die, he finally decided Springtrap had been punished enough and resolved to get the band back together. Or perhaps there is still a hidden spark of tortured humanity inside Phone Freddy, an often ignored piece that after decades of being run down, despite and alone, craved to hear the voice of a friend once more, and the only creature in the world approaching the status of friend to him was an undead sadistic robotic legomorph. Which is sad, but when you choose to be an evil psychopath, that's what you get. We know that Mike survived the fire, and so oddly did a small Freddy doll, a doll that might just be the same one that housed the magical music box from Game 2, whatever powers it might possess. Whoever wins that lucky auction might just have a pair of uninvited guests. And here we end our story, looking forward to Halloween when Game 4 comes out. And while it's easy to make theories, we never really know what to expect. But make no mistake, we have more to worry about than ever before. The purple guy is no longer the scariest monster we might encounter. Spring Bonnie is alive. Spring Freddy is alive. And no matter if our next adventure takes us to the past, the present, or the future, all who enter the world of Five Nights at Freddy's must fear the Color Brothers! I've seen your face in the shadows I've seen your face in the places I wasn't meant to be. I've 